Good morning, Christ Church. I'm Scott Kreider, the youth pastor, and this is Aiden, and he's still in his jammies, probably like most of y'all, and we've already been outside riding his little scooter, and he insisted to keep his helmet on for you. And this is Eliza, and hopefully she is quiet enough for us to do this this morning. Um, we really miss you all. I, I miss seeing y'all all the time. I miss the youth group, certainly. Um, we, we actually hung out over Zoom on Wednesday night. We got into the Word together, and we split to life groups. That was just really, really fun. I'm looking forward to doing that each Wednesday while we're not able to meet in person like usual. And so we're going to lead you in reading our opening psalm. If you would like to read along, feel free to do so. It'll be The words will be on the screen out of Psalm 118. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. I will give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, y'all, so good to be with you this morning. And I'll pass this on to the worship team live in the sanctuary. Well, thank you, Pastor Scott and Aiden and Eliza and Sheriff Woody, whoever else was there. We're sending an extra blessing of grace and peace your way today. Um, and thank you all for tuning in today. It's Palm Sunday, so let's kick off this Holy Week right and sing together. Here we go. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Welcome you 
find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, when we see you, we find strength to face the day. Yes, we do. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. You're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way among
just want to be with you. King of glory, fill this place. Just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. in your presence until you come again and we'll sing hallelujah until you come again and we'll dance in your presence until you come houses all around this city, even around the world as different people are joining into this service live right now that we have just declared King of glory, fill this place. God, I thank you that we are declaring that over every space that we are in. That we are declaring it over our homes and our circumstances exactly as they are in this moment. King of glory, fill this place. And God, we know that your presence is already among us. We know that your presence is here, is everywhere that anybody has gathered in this moment. And so as we say, fill this place, in some ways what we're really praying is open our eyes to your presence that is already among us. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together in worship as your people, as your church. We thank you that this circumstance and this situation has not taken you by surprise. We thank you that you are moving in your church all around the world mightily in this season. We thank you so much that church is more than just four walls or a sanctuary that we come to, but that we are your church, your body. 
And so God, we thank you for the new opportunities you are birthing in us to be your church in this season. And so Holy Spirit, as we continue in a time of prayer, I ask that you bring to mind people that you are calling us to reach out to this week. Bring to mind needs. Bring to mind situations. And right now in this moment, as we just kind of still our minds and try and be present where our bodies are, even if kids are running around and it's crazy. Lord, we just give you a moment to speak to us. You're always speaking, but we're quieting ourselves to listen. What do you have for us? God, we lift up a praise to you in this moment. Let us speak out with our mouths, with our words, praise for who you are. Right now in homes all across this city, let's begin to speak out praise for who you are. who are on the front lines in the medical field. We speak out their names and we ask for protection upon them. Let's just begin declaring out names that we're praying over for covering and for protection in the medical field. Now we speak out the names of all of those that we know are, are working tireless, tirelessly right now, whether that be in grocery stores and shipping, in all kinds of fields right now that um, it's just a new season. We speak out their names. We pray for your covering, your protection, your provision. we speak out the names of our friends and our loved ones and even ourselves who might have lost jobs, lost income, who are struggling with the unknowns financially in this season. We speak out their name. we pray for those who are sick that we might know directly we pray for healing and we speak out their names to you we lift up our families to you. Even if they're in the room with us right now, we're going to declare their names. God, we speak out the names of all of those 
in government, in decision-making positions, leaders of businesses, we declare their names to you right now. Give them wisdom and guidance in your Holy Spirit. we begin to declare the names of places of businesses, whatever comes to mind, churches, names of organizations that you just bring to our minds. Let us declare those names and offer those up to you. we thank you that you are in our midst. We thank you for the truth that you are always working. God, gently remind us even this week (laughs) for those of us who are feeling lonely to be reminded that your presence is always with us. For those of us who feel like it's just chaos right now, remind us that you are the Prince of Peace. Hosanna, God, save us. (laughs) We join with that cry all those years ago. (laughs) And even in that moment leading into Holy Week, they didn't fully understand the picture of what was happening. And we don't really fully understand how you're working in our midst, but Hosanna, God, save us. Lord, we thank you, we worship you, we praise you. And it's in the name above every names that we can say, so be it. Amen, amen, amen. I wanna encourage you if um, a name was brought to your mind <laughs> or a need was brought to your mind in this time that you have permission to get out your phone and call somebody. Or if you have a word of encouragement for somebody, that's what I love about this body here as Christ Church is that when we are together in this space, people are moving all over the place as the Holy Spirit is moving in His people. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is still moving in His people. And so I <laughs> wanna encourage you if, if a need was brought to your mind to reach out to them right now, if somebody in the room with you, if you felt like that the Lord was calling you to pray over them, do that right now. We are the body of the church. We are the church. And we can still do that even when we're not physically together. And I just wanna thank you so much, church, for leaning into this season. <laughs> I love uh, a few years ago on a Palm Sunday, I heard a pastor talk about that phrase in Mark 11, where it says, those who went ahead and those who followed all shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And she said, I wonder if yes, that's physically what happened in that moment. There was a great crowd. And so those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But she said, I also wonder in the mystery of God, (laughs) if those who have gone ahead of us in in time, (laughs) if those of us in just, all around the connection that God has of his believers, those who went ahead and those who follow shouted Hosanna in the highest, this connection that he has for us spiritually. And I think we can experience that as a church, even this morning. And I wanna thank you church for faithfully giving in this season. It's an unknown season and we're all adjusting to this new normal as we go. But I want you to know that we as a church are passionate. about meeting the needs of those that God has entrusted to us. And so we thank you for giving because it's allowing us to meet really practical, immediate needs that are happening right now. And if there's a need that you have right now, I wanna encourage you um, to reach out to us if it's spiritual or physical need, um, to reach out to us on the email or call the church this week. Um, 
but we have been receiving needs among our church body. And I also want you to know that we have intentionally this week reached out to 2,500 homes in the immediate area of our church, the walking area of the church. And we've said, we're your local church and we're here to help and serve. And we've been getting uh, things being poured in of how we can serve our local community. And so you're giving is allowing us to be the church right now to our community. And it is powerful to see how God is moving. And we also know that, that in this time, there are gonna be immediate needs and needs to come. And we all are just open-handed for how God wants to work in his people and work through us. So I just wanna thank you for giving. And as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings this morning online, I know it's very different. We're just gonna pray over those gifts and we're gonna continue in our worship. God, I thank you that you give us, <laughs> that you entrust us to steward your resources, what is already yours. What a gift that you allow us to steward those. God, I pray for wisdom. I pray that you would bless each person this morning, that you would remind us that it is all yours, <laughs> that with you, we don't have to live in a mindset of fear or scarcity because you are a God of abundance and provision. And so Holy Spirit, I ask that you would give peace <laughs> in every situation right now and give wisdom to this church to how to steward these gifts, to meet the needs of your people. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It's all for you. In your name, amen. Amen. It's an amazing um, situation we find ourselves in. It's global upending, upheaval. It's got us in situations that we never would have imagined ourselves in. I found out just last night that a cast member of mine from Disney is in the hospital in critical care with COVID-19. A, a friend's brother passed away. There's just so much unknown right now that it can just, it can shake you to your core. But it's in times like this where you must lean in to what you know what you believe, your faith. And I know that no matter what comes our way, no matter, no matter what comes our way, we still serve a God who heals. So if you find yourself in a position of just unknown and or sick or you've got loved ones who, who aren't doing well physically, just take this to heart because we serve the healing. You hold my every moment. You calm the raging sea. You walk with me through fire and heal all my disease. I trust.
to be able to pray this morning. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. For some of us, maybe this is the first time in our lives we, we've said that, we've sung that, we've prayed that, and really meant that. Sometimes it's when other things are stripped away, and only then do we see the truth, the beauty, the all-sufficient nature of that kind of proclamation which Lisi just so powerfully and beautifully led us in. Take just a moment, one more moment. And let that be our prayer. Let that be the spirit that not only fills our homes but fills our hearts. going to ask you to do something that might seem a little strange, but right there, wherever you may be, I'm going to ask you to stand. We would do that if we were gathered in one space for the reading of God's word, and so I'm going to ask you to do that right where you are. What we do with our bodies in worship is every bit as important as what we do with our minds or our voices, and so as we stand for the reading of God's word, coming to us this morning from Matthew's gospel, chapter 21, beginning with verse 1 through verse 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and some others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And even in your home, you may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you, Phil. This week, known as Holy Week, is certainly going to be different for all of us. But we want you to know that we are so thankful for how God has made a way for us to still gather, for us to still come together. And we are planning that right now as we speak. So we want you to know that as Monday, Thursday comes around, we are going to be gathering at 7 o'clock online. And it's going to be a special night. It's going to be uh, interesting, you might say, because my family and I are uh, inviting you and your family to join us around our table and we will break bread, we will, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper, we will wash feet, we will uh, remember what it means to celebrate that night, that last night when Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. So that will be Thursday night at 7 o'clock. We want you to join us right through all of our streaming platforms uh, through Christ Church. Good Friday. We'll do something uh, a little bit different, but yet we will still gather and we will have our Good Friday uh, Tenebrae service, but it's going to be coming from all different homes gathered uh, together at the same time from throughout our congregation. And we will connect our homes to the sanctuary for our music and for the extinguishing of the candles as that night gets darker and darker as we meditate upon the crucifixion of our Lord. It'll be a special time. 
So please, even though it'll be very different than what we may all have expected, Thursday night, 7 p.m., Friday night, 7 p.m., invite those you love, and let's join together right here in that way. We've had such a great time the last two weeks on Wednesday evenings uh, gathering for word and worship and prayer. And this week we won't gather on Wednesday because we're going to gather on Thursday and Friday instead. So just wanted to make that clear to you. Of course, next week, as somebody said, Easter is not canceled. That could be the silliest thing we'd ever say. Jesus has risen and we will celebrate and we will commemorate that uh, next Sunday, Uh, truly. We don't know exactly what that'll look like yet. It's moment by moment, day by day right now, but trust in that we will gather uh, in this way as the Lord allows. So would you pray with me before we get into the word here this morning? Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful. We are so thankful for your faithfulness, the goodness that you show the faithfulness that you prove over and over and over again throughout the history of your creation, throughout the the history, the salvation history of your people. And so now today, Lord, open our eyes, unstop our ears, and open our hearts, Lord God, to see and to hear and to receive what you would speak now through your word, Holy Spirit, Let us understand. Holy Spirit, let us live in the truth that now these ancient words would express as you breathe them into us so that they may live through us, Lord, we pray. We thank you and we trust you in this. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all of God's people, wherever we may be, said, amen, amen. Expectations. We all have them, don't we? Now maybe we call them by, by other names like, like hopes or dreams, goals, vision, purpose, mission, objectives, whatever you may want to call them. But in the end, aren't these all simply synonyms for expectations? All these terms I just mentioned, they imply that we expect certain things to happen in life, and we expect these things to happen in certain ways. Every single one of us has expectations for how our lives are supposed to be. We have expectations for ourselves and for one another. We even have expectations for God. Wouldn't you agree? Now, if I had one, I'd be willing to bet the farm that none of us expected the season of Lent 2020 would go anything like this. Maybe you had expected to fast one day a week in this season, and now you are fasting indefinitely from every single restaurant you've ever been to. Maybe you had expected to spend a few less hours at the office this season, you know, spend more time at home. Now you're spending all your time at home and you're not quite sure when you'll ever be back to the office. Maybe you had expected that right now you would be eagerly preparing for all this season uh, typically brings in our culture, the, the end of the school year and proms and graduations and weddings, the beginning of, of, of touring season, of baseball season, of spring break and vacation season. But instead you find all those things have been abruptly canceled or indefinitely postponed. Or maybe you never expected your line of work to be called essential or non-essential in the way that it has been recently. And now you're trying to cope with all the ramifications of what those categories might mean for you and your family. And of course, as we've already said, none of us expected this Palm Sunday and the rest of Holy Week to follow to look anything like it does with all of us gathering via technology in spirit, even though we are unable to gather in body. When the Lord invited us into this journey, into the wilderness with him for 40 days of fasting and repentance, what did we expect? Have you asked yourself that question yet? I think it's safe to say, whatever you and I may have expected, it certainly wasn't this. But you know, maybe if we had been in Jerusalem 
nearly 2,000 years ago for that very first Holy Week, I have to believe most of us would find ourselves saying the very same thing. Whatever we expected, mm, it wasn't this. In our gospel reading for this morning, Matthew makes it clear we are certainly not the first generation to have expectations. That's for sure. This is a, a human thing, if there ever was such a thing. And on that distinctive day, which we commemorate today as Palm Sunday, when Jesus would enter Jerusalem for the final time leading up to his death, everybody had expectations. Even Jesus himself. The disciples, of course, the crowd, the residents of the city, the Jewish leaders, just like all of us, everybody had expectations. But this shouldn't surprise us. Matthew tells us that Jesus had been dealing with expectations of others from the very beginning, throughout his entire life, but certainly throughout his entire ministry, well before what we might call the week of his passion, the week of his suffering, which is already upon us. If we turn back only a page or two in Matthew's gospel, back to chapter 20, it's important to hear a little context here. So listen to these words, starting in chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something, and Jesus said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. The mother of James and John, these sons of Zebedee, she had great expectations for her sons, which perhaps they indeed shared. But we heard Jesus reply, you do not know what you are asking. It would appear that mother and sons and the other 10 disciples had expectations, all right, expectations concerning power and authority and what they thought it would mean to rule and to reign with Christ. But it would also appear Jesus felt the need to address what was lacking in their expectations, what was missing in their understanding of what kind of king Jesus is exactly and what kind of kingdom he brings. And so Jesus goes on, verse 25 of chapter 20. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came to be ser not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Now to be fair, we need to recognize how some of these titles that Matthew attributes to Jesus can create some understandable confusion among those first century followers of Christ especially when it comes to expectations. For example, Matthew uses this title, Son of Man, more than any other attributed to Jesus, 30 times in his gospel. And so we need to understand something about this title, this name, Son of Man. Today, oftentimes, we use it in our context as God, uh, Son of Man is Jesus' humanity. Son of God is Jesus' divinity. And that's, that's true, but certainly it was something, something else to those first century ears something that every faithful Jew in Jesus' day would have drawn expectations from as we hear of it in the book of Daniel. And as we turn there now, if you'll turn there with me, chapter 7, verse 13, verse 14, together, as Daniel in his vision proclaims, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. 
and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. By the first century, the people of Israel had great expectations as to how and when this particular son of man would be revealed and how his kingdom should come upon the earth. Would God be faithful in revealing, in inaugurating, and exalting this son of man and his kingdom? Absolutely. But would God do it in the way most of his people had come to expect? Hmm. That is the question, isn't it? Jesus knows that he is about his father's business in ushering in this kingdom of God and that has been his sole purpose from the beginning. Remember, when he came out of the wilderness three years prior, what was his proclamation? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It is upon you. It is near. It is within your reach. But Jesus also knows as these days ahead will demonstrate whatever God's people expected that to look like, it wasn't this. Well, we've seen how the disciples and at least one mama had expectations. And if we continue reading, we will see the expectations of others surrounding Jesus also revealed. So continuing with Matthew 20, verse 29, the story continues. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. As Jesus and his disciples leave Jericho on their way to Jerusalem, this this crowd of, of, of countryside folk, you might say, joins them for the journey. And we should expect they too, they too certainly have expectations. Whatever they may have seen and heard of and from Jesus up to this point, they seem to have some idea that he is to be some kind of king. But isn't it interesting how Matthew is sure to tell us it is, it is the crowd who rebuke these two blind men. These two blind men crying out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. In a way, this crowd is very much like the disciples were, if you remember, when they rebuked those parents who were bringing their children to Jesus so that he might lay hands on them and pray over them. Stop and think about that. Why rebuke? Why try and deny children and blind men access to Jesus? Well, it's just a matter of expectations. You can't expect the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the the Son of David, this one who is the King, chosen and anointed. You can't expect one of such greatness to waste time on the least among us, can you? How do you rule and reign over a kingdom if you're spending all your time on those kinds of people? And aren't there far more important plans and people that demand our attention and our energy? Well, that's what we'd expect if we were talking about kingdoms of men. But that's not what we're talking about here, are we? In the kingdom of God, it's very, very different. Not at all what we might expect. And so stopping, verse 32, Jesus called to them and he said, what do you want me to do for you? Notice the same question he asked the mother of the sons of Zebedee. A different answer this time. And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus moved with compassion touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Jesus shows himself a king, a different kind of king, a king of compassion who is ushering in a kingdom of mercy, which can only be seen by those who are willing to receive and to give mercy. 
For those whose eyes have been opened, Jesus is a radically different kind of king who brings what seems to be a radically different upside down kingdom when compared to whatever kingdoms of this world we have experienced before, what they have taught us to expect. And that leads us, of course, to our gospel passage for today, back to chapter 21. And so now when they drew near to Jerusalem, this is all that has led up to this entry into the city, the city of the king. And when they drew near and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. And then Matthew is careful to quote Zechariah chapter nine, starting with verse nine. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. These words of the prophet Zechariah, written over 500 years before Christ, they look forward to a time when God will defeat Israel's enemies and establish his everlasting kingdom. And now Matthew wants to be crystal clear. It is this very saving movement of God, which Zechariah predicted, that is now being set into motion by Jesus. The king is coming, but he is not mounted on a charger. He is not riding in a chariot fit for war. Instead, he comes humble, mounted on a donkey, a beast of burden. He is arriving in Zion, in Jerusalem, right before Passover, no less. So what does this mean? What should we expect? I mean, surely this must be the time when God will bring deliverance to his people once and for all. Surely this is the way in which God will establish his kingdom above all others, as Daniel prophesied. Surely this is the one through whom God shall reign forever, as he is rightly enthroned as the son of man, the, the son of David, the promised Messiah. I mean, talk about expectations. And once again, Will God be faithful to God's word? Absolutely. Will God keep his word according to his people's expectations? Hmm. Or in other words, will God always fulfill God's promises in the ways that we think God should? Ah, let us keep reading. Starting back in verse six, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Everybody knows what this means. Whether it is laying out the red carpet for royalty or in our case, it's usually some sort of superstar. But the branches we don't read First Maccabees as Protestants, but we should, because when it came to a time when Israel's enemies had been defeated, 175 years before Christ, the Jews had cut branches and laid them down to celebrate their own liberation. Jews in Jesus' day would have known, this is what this means. Here comes the one who shall free us. Here comes the one who should liberate us. And the crowds that went before him, verse nine, and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, O God, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Remember, the crowds are coming with Jesus, according to Matthew's account. And the crowds saying, who, who is this? And the crowds that had come with Christ said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. As we read together earlier this morning, this refrain, Hosanna, save us, it comes, as you know, from Psalm 118, which is part of what we call the Hallel, 113 to 118, those psalms. Hallel, meaning praise, hallelujah, meaning praise God. And by Jesus' time, these were expected songs of praise sung by Jewish pilgrims and worshipers as they ascended the mount in Jerusalem surrounding all of the annual festivals, especially Passover. But now, in the mouths of these crowds at least, this psalm praising God's faithfulness and trusting in his ultimate salvation, this had taken on new meaning. 
The king, the long awaited king is coming. And in the days ahead, Jerusalem would become a city nearly erupting with expectations. Even those in Jerusalem who initially asked, who is this? By the time this week unfolds, they would have their question answered in some way, whether they expected the answer they received or not. Well, like we all said, expectations. We all have them, don't we? (laughs) Even Jesus We can't forget his expectations. While Matthew tells us how the crowds praised and celebrated the coming of this king, intoxicated by their own expectations, Luke tells us in his account, Jesus, when he saw the city, wept. Luke 19, verses 41 through 42. And when Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. We must remember what Jesus does once he enters the city. This is why context when we study scripture is so important. What what comes before and what follows behind? Because when Jesus enters Jerusalem, remember what happens. He enters the temple, what was then considered the house of the Lord. And once there, overturning the tables of the money changers, he shares with us the shattered and the unmet expectation of God. He said to them, it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Talk about shattered expectations. Palm Sunday. Not what we expected this year, is it? But perhaps it wasn't truly what anyone really expected back then either. Not really. And in the days ahead, what we remember today as Holy Week would reveal just as much. But what what did they expect? What do we expect? This is the king who will be coronated, but not with an ornate bejeweled crown of gold, no, but with a crown of thorns. This is the king who will be high and lifted up, but not on some elegant throne of polished cedar, but upon the roughness of a raw and criminal Roman cross. And in all of it, hear me, in all of it, God is absolutely faithful to what God had promised. Is it what we expected? No. But through it, does God bring what we needed? Absolutely, yes. So what about today, my friends? What about right now? Have we become too comfortable and too familiar, myself included, with with, with waving the palm branches and shouting Hosanna like we usually do on this day, that we have forgotten what most of those who shouted that word 2,000 years ago that they did not know what they were asking. They did not know the things of God's kingdom that make for God's peace. On this Palm Sunday, we need to ask ourselves right where we are, do we? Do we know the things of God's kingdom that make for God's peace? Have we yet learned that to follow King Jesus and to live in his kingdom means we accept his invitation to lay down our expectations like cloaks upon the road? Lay down those expectations of what our lives are supposed to look like and instead completely entrust our living and our dying in his almighty hands. We sing, We sing and we sing and we sing. All glory to our God and King. We sing and we sing and we sing. You hold my world, you hold my life in your hands. 
Do we know what we are saying? Do we know? Could it be? Could it be that in all this uncertainty, in all this disruption, in all our disappointments, and in all our unmet expectations today, that God is yet advancing his kingdom? Could it be that we need to humble ourselves like those two blind men along the road and cry out to him, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy and let our eyes be opened so that we too may recover our sight in this time in order to see your kingdom coming and to follow our king as he leads us into it. Maybe that should be our expectation for this Palm Sunday. (laughs) With that, my friends, it is time for us to pray. I hope right now in your home you are seizing this opportunity as we sang before when it comes to your spirit filling this place. As Pastor Jen said, it is not just about a building, a sanctuary, places that we are used to encountering the presence of God. I pray that you are seeking that and experiencing that right where you are. We don't worship in a temple made of brick and stone and mortar anymore. We are the temple of the Spirit, the temple of the Lord, the living body. And so with that in mind, I want to invite us to enter into a time of prayer now as we begin to pull things together in closing today. And so I want you to do this. I've asked you to do some things with your body, to stand during the reading of the gospel. I want you just to extend your hands like this. I want you just to open your hands. Because when we open our hands in this way, something follows within our our hearts, I believe. And so with open hands, with open hearts, I want you right where you are to consider what expectations have you been grieving. Last week, Pastor Jen led us through what it means to to know Jesus is present with us in our grief, and it was a powerful word for what we need to hear today. And we need to recognize what are those unmet expectations? What are the things that we are grieving? What are the things that we feel loss and mourning? associated with in this time, in all this change? And how do we hold those like this now, before the Lord, before the Lord? Open hands, open hearts. So hold those plans. Maybe it was graduation. You're a senior who's waited for this. And it doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. Maybe you've been planning your wedding and you have dreamt about that day. And things are on hold for right now. Maybe you never thought you'd file for unemployment in your entire life, but this week you did. Maybe you never thought that in the golden years, of your aged loved one's life, you wouldn't be able to visit them in person whenever you wanted to. Maybe you even moved across the country to live near them or brought them near to you so you could do that very thing. And now that's been denied you in these days. So many things. Hold them like this. Hold them like this. Lord, we trust you. And I invite you just to speak words to the Lord right now and and, and confess your trust and show your grief, show your mourning, but release these. What are the things that we have to let go of? What must we confess? Lord, I have been placing my faith in my expectations more than I have put my faith in you. And we sang, Jesus, you are all I need. 
And yet it's times like this where we are tempted to hold on, that we are challenged. Do we really know what that means? To say that, Lord, you are enough for me and I trust you. My life is in your hands. The life of my family is in your hands. The provision for my family is in your hands. My healing is in your hands. And whether I may live or whether I may die, I am in your hands, no matter what may come. That is the prayer of a disciple of Jesus Christ whose eyes have been opened, who has cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. To right now where you are, receive healing of body, healing of soul, healing of mind and spirit and brokenness of heart and say, Lord, this isn't what we expected. This isn't what we thought this would be. Yet you, you are faithful. And you can be trusted no matter what may come. No matter what we thought we should be able to comprehend or what we thought we should be able to control, Lord, we lay that down at your feet. We don't have palm branches today. We don't have cloaks today, but we lay these at your feet. You desire our hearts more than those other things anyway. And lastly, right now, Lord, we ask you, what expectations do you have of us? That maybe we have failed certainly to meet, but perhaps even worse, maybe we have never even considered the things of your kingdom that would make for peace, the ways of your upside down kingdom where the first shall be last and the last shall be first, where those who long to find their life, must lose it. And those who seek to hang on to their life will never gain it. Lord, open our eyes to your kingdom. Your kingdom come within us. Your kingdom that is meant to be made manifest in the earth through us. And let this be a time, Lord. Let this Palm Sunday be like none other. Let this Holy Week be like none other where we as your people Discover with eyes opened, O oh God, what it means to know you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a king unlike any other. That even with our unmet expectations, if we trust you, you will fill our hands with your expectations for your kingdom. for your glory, for your honor, to be your people in such a time as this. As you said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all that we need, all that we need shall be added unto us. Lord, that is our prayer this day that we would see you for the king you are, not the king we would expect you to be, that we would receive your kingdom for what it truly is, love, peace, joy, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, that your kingdom would dawn in our hearts this day. Lord, we want to see you, see you and know you for the king you are. Lord, we want to see and know your kingdom and to know your reign in our hearts so that it be made manifest in us and through us as it first was in Jesus Christ. And so now, church, wherever we may be, 
Let us join our hearts and our voices in the prayer, the prayer of a disciple, the prayer of a church who seeks to walk in the way of Jesus Christ, to walk in the way of his kingdom. Let's pray as he taught his disciples, as he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Church, be encouraged. The king has come and we are promised that he is coming again. And in this time between the times, this time in which he has destined us to live, he is present with us by his spirit. And he has promised to give us all we need. What we need is him. And so may that become more powerfully real in your heart, in your home, this day, as we remember what it means to cry out, Hosanna, save us, O God. Blessed indeed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Be blessed this holy week, and we'll see you again, if not before, on Monday, Thursday, and on Good Friday. And so now, those who bear the name of the Lord receive the blessing spoken over us for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. We pray this and we proclaim this over one another in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. People of God, go to love and serve the Lord and one another in his peace. Amen, amen, amen.